John, it took me two and a half hours to go through the bill. It's about 100 pages long. There's so many poison pills in it for our democracy, so many shocking things. If I had to ask you what the worst part of it is, I know you couldn't answer me with one example, but <laughs> tell me what the most worrisome parts of this bill are to you and the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. At the top of the list, or close to the top of the list, is the power it gives to the federal cabinet to pass new laws, known as regulations, which have the force of law, uh, where they get to define what is a social media provider. And so without consulting parliament, without transparency, cabinet meetings are held in secret. The cabinet can secretly uh, talk about plan and then declare into being new regulations that could define a social media provider uh, or a social media service could be uh, something like uh, a church or a nonprofit or a citizens advocacy group or independent media like like the rebel and true north and epoch times and so on uh, you could be deemed by the federal cabinet to be a social media service and so we could have federal bureaucrats uh, looking at the content of the uh, email newsletter that, that the church sends out to its its uh, members and supporters. That is frightening. They can decide that. Uh, they get to uh, finalize the, the definition of harm. There's, there's this wide latitude. Uh, if this bill is passed, federal cabinet uh, can turn this into an Orwellian nightmare without any democratic accountability whatsoever. Uh, unless and until there's an election and, and a change of government. Uh, but that that's uh, the, the power of regulation is is frightening because it, it takes the the legislative authority of, of of parliament and transfers it to the prime minister's office effectively. You know, it's not incredible. I went on for two and a half hours yesterday. I didn't even think of that risk. I mean, I sort of thought, okay, social media provider, I know what that is, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, but says who? Uh, you know, it, and if, if, if the bill said uh, social media provider means uh, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, X, whatever, uh, okay, it would still be a terrible piece of legislation for so many reasons, but right. at least we would have certainty on right. that front. Right. But they could they could decide right. that that uh, the Rebel News is a uh, so, uh, social media service, uh, you know, because you're, you're sending out emails and posting YouTube videos. Yeah. Uh, nothing stops the federal government from declaring uh, a church, a nonprofit, a charity, an independent media uh, to be covered by this. Uh, the other frightening thing is you, you've got. Well, let me, let me the, stop you for one second. Hold that thought. Don't lose that thought. Don't lose it, because I want to add. I want to add a, a a clause to what you just said there. If we are deemed to be a social media company, then that gives them all sorts of invasive powers to come in and root around in our material. I did cover that part. I just thought, okay, they they want to snoop around Elon Musk's business. They want to look through his files, look through and do education and advocacy. I did think about that yesterday, but I only thought of Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg as the target. Deeming us a social media service lets bureaucrats come into our office and have access to our computers. I didn't understand the threat until you just said that. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to no, say what okay. happens if we're deemed a social media network, because I never contemplated that until you put the fear into me. Anyhow, sorry to interrupt your flow. You were about to make a second point before I interrupted you. I just noticed it because the 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 bill says expressly that the, the federal cabinet uh, gets to define what is a social media service. They get to define that. It's not defined by... The law that is passed by Parliament. If it was defined as being limited to, uh, you know, F Facebook and Twitter, uh, again, it would be terrible legislation. But we wouldn't have to worry about that. But now, now we do. Uh, are they going to go after uh, charities and say we want to look into your electronic records and we want to monitor and control what you're putting into your email newsletter that you're sending out to your donors and supporters? Um, it, in conjunction with that, we're going to hire a vast new army of bureaucrats that will have the power to uh, shut down. These regulations also empower the, the federal cabinet to create penalties and to specify what kind of content is allowed or not allowed. Yeah. Um, we've already got a situation, I, I've been thinking about this, this chant, I'm sure you've heard it and many, many of the viewers of The Rebel have heard it, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Yeah. Now, uh, in Estonia and Germany and Czech Republic, the authorities have declared that to be criminal speech. Uh, it was 
uh, somebody was charged with it in the Netherlands and then ultimately acquitted by the Dutch Supreme Court saying it was not criminal speech. We had a man in, in Calgary uh, charged with saying that uh, charges were stayed. But do we really want the government parsing political slogans, uh, however offensive they might be, uh, because this is this is the real risk. They're increasing the penalty for uh, advocating genocide. So let's advocate the, the killing of, of a people group, uh, presumably based on ethnicity or religion or otherwise. Um, maximum penalty is five years. I think that's enough of a deterrent. Uh, it's already dangerous considering how the government could uh, use its power to define advocacy for genocide. But no, that's not good enough. Uh, that penalty for advocating for genocide, ju just words alone, you could go to prison for life yeah. for that. I, I and, think that five, and, five, year, five years maximum penalty is more than adequate as a deterrent. And by the way, there's this new standalone hate speech crime that they're proposing that doesn't just cover that example. Uh, there's a list of prohibited characteristics that you're not allowed to offend, uh, or their phrases to foment hatred towards. And in that list, there's the ones that we're used to, race, religion, sex, national origin, things like that. But there's sexual orientation, and there's two new ones, gender identity and gender expression. And what do those words even mean? Gender identity is you say, well, I don't care what you say. I feel like a woman. I feel like a girl. I, sure, I have a beard and I still have my twig and berries, but I identify as a woman. So I'm going into the girls' change room now and I'm going to swim uh, against the girls. That's gender identity. Gender expression is, okay, I shave my beard, I put on makeup, and I'm pretending to be a girl. If you run afoul of those two banned characteristics, you could be liable for a hate crime. I mean, listen, we don't have the details here yet, but that standalone hate crime is is life in prison. It, it's not just, I mean, and think about what a controversy transgenderism, trans, transgenderism is in the country. Anyone who dares to challenge it can be charged with a hate crime. Am I wrong on that, John? You're, you're the guy who's been looking at this through a legal lens. Is it true that if you criticize transgenderism and someone complains, you could either be hit with a criminal prosecution, you could be hit with a recognizance order where you're put under house arrest, you could be prosecuted before the Human Rights Tribunal and subject to $20,000 in compensation and a $50,000 fine. If you fight against transgenderism in a way that the government doesn't like, you could be fined or even jailed or put under house arrest. Did I get that right? You got it right. And this gets back to the duplication because the gender identity and gender expression have already been added to the criminal code of Canada. So the willful promotion of hatred uh, against a group on the basis of gender identity or gender expression is already a criminal code offense as things stand right now. So potentially, uh, if you were a vociferous critic and maybe you didn't choose your words wisely and you you came out with with a, a sledgehammer maybe you, you used an atomic bomb to kill a fly if you go over the top on criticizing this uh transgender ideology and and the activism uh you could be facing criminal charges but there there you would have the defense of truth you would have the defense of discussing a topic in the public interest you would have the uh um you would have other defenses available the other duplicative thing, and this is really interesting, the criminal code already empowers judges to uh, uh, impose a more severe penalty if the judge has, who has reviewed the facts and has looked into it, uh, if, if the judge is sentencing somebody to a crime of uh, sentencing somebody for murder or assault or vandalism or any other crime, if the judge determines that that crime was motivated by hatred, the judge already has the authority to impose uh, a, a stronger sentence. Now, I'll give you an example. If there's a bunch of idiot thugs who very mindlessly put uh, a bunch of graffiti on the wall, on the outside wall of a synagogue, but they don't really care where they're doing it, and they're just using any old wall, they're guilty of vandalism, uh, property destruction, which is a criminal code offense. However, if they're painting uh, swastikas and slogans like death to the Jews on the synagogue wall, they could get a more severe punishment because that would be 
a hate crime. So the judges already have the authority that, that if a crime, property damage, murder, assault, whatever, if a crime is motivated by hate, the judge can impose a more severe sentence. That's already on the books. And this gets back to this grandstanding of, you know, oh, well, now we need a standalone hate crime. No, uh, it's one thing to have a stiffer penalty where there is evidence that the crime was motivated by hate, but you have to actually be found guilty of doing of that other crime criminal. of the underlying crime. And and then you can get a higher penalty, yeah. but a standalone hate crime is, uh, it's just Orwellian. Mm-hmm.